Welcome to the Fran Snyder Podcast, where I talk to artists and music fans to explore how music connects us through great stories and experiences. Brought to you by the Listening Room Network. Today's guest, Kira Small. How are you? Fran Snyder. I'm all right. How are you? <laughs> good, good. I don't know if you noticed, we have a formality with this podcast now, especially for the YouTube viewers. We do proof of pants to make sure that you're taking this seriously. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love this because I get to show off my, my awesome uh, Buddha pants. Wow, Joy. Those are fantastic. Joy Ike had polka dot pants that she claimed, yeah. she claimed that she does not wear outside of the house. Buddha pants. Buddha, oh, they actually are called Buddha pants. That yes, wasn't, and okay. they fit. I am obsessed. And like, I don't, I'm never going back to tight pants again, I don't think. I don't know. I'm going to have to. But yeah. um, I just bought three more pairs because I had a Labor Day sale. They look super comfy. They are super comfy. They're like pajamas. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna wear my uh, Kira Small 3 AM shirt, but it's a little stinky. Oh yeah, it's a little stinky. So I'll just show it to the camera. Yeah, um, that was from my um, my pledge music, May pledge music, rest in peace campaign. Yeah, <laughs> um, when I put the record out. So only a handful of people have that shirt. Well, I dig it. I yeah. still wear it. Um, awesome. So let's tell the the kind folks at home where you're from. And how you wound up in Nashville? Well, no, let's let's skip the Nashville part. Just tell us where you're from. <laughs> uh, I am from outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a little town called Muskego. Mm -hmm. And um, left there at 18, went off to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and um, was there for three years. But my second summer off, I got a gig in San Antonio at Fiesta Texas singing and dancing. So I went from like hardcore, like real cerebral jazz studies at Berkeley to like singing in a country show and doing like nuke, you know, d dancing yeah. and stuff, um, which was a blast. Um, and then so when I finished Berkeley, um, I went back to Fiesta, Texas and danced and sang around there some more. And then I went to, then I, somebody I met there uh, hooked me up with a gig at Pat O'Brien's in New Orleans. Yes, this is like this was a fascinating story for me. It was like this was like you this is where you really earned your stripes as a performer, kind of thrown to the wolves in well, New Orleans. Yeah, well I mean I was only I only did that gig for like two months. I, I landed in New Orleans on January first, nineteen ninety four. I was twenty one. I had everything I owned in the back of my pickup truck. Um and I'm driving into the French quarter and it's like the Rose Bowl or the or the balloon bowl or the soda bowl. I don't know what the heck bowl. Sugar bowl, um, probably. So there's people everywhere, yeah, and um, and I was like, me, 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 me. and uh, <laughs> and then I, you know, start doing this gig, and I don't know what the heck I'm doing, but um, but I played through Mardi Gras. It was nuts, and but it was so nuts that I was like, I gotta get my claustrophobic butt out of here. I can't, I can't deal. And uh, so by March first, I was uh, back in Texas. I moved to Austin. Okay. And, um, and in Austin, my buddy, drummer buddy that I'd gone to Berkeley with, that I was crashing with him and his roommates, he was playing drums for a guy that played at a bar called Don's Depot. He goes, oh, man, yeah. I'm playing at this trippy bar. You got to come see this gig. It's a trip. And so I went in and um, not long after that, you know, Don heard that here's this young girl that had played at Pat O'Brien's. And so I played a few songs. And then a few weeks later, someone who had a regular Thursday night gig was looking to, you know, had family stuff going on and needed to vacate. And so I auditioned and got the gig it's four hours a night for 50 bucks plus tips. Wow. That's such that's an iconic, where I such, really cut it. You know? Such an iconic place now. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize you went that far back with Don's Depot. That's wild. Oh yeah. And yeah. Uh, did you wind up going back to Berkeley to teach? Mm -hmm. I did. I was in Austin for about five and a half years five and a half, six years and playing at Don's the whole time. Um, and uh, was looking into going to graduate school. But then I realized very quickly that because I missed the kind of cerebral aspect of music and realized quickly that you can't go to graduate school and like take intro to stuff. You have to like go for something. Yeah. So I started thinking about what would I want to do, which long story short, I started calling people at Berkeley. I was like, I, I, maybe I could, maybe I teach at a place like Berkeley. And I was like, I don't know if I need a graduate degree to do that. Let me start making phone calls and finding out pretty soon. My old teacher, Jan Shapiro, was then the um, chair of the voice department. She was like, I've been waiting to hear from you. I knew you'd come back. Like, 
So I went and did that for a couple of years. That's great. Yeah, one of one of the yeah. one of the highlights of when you played the Listening Room Festival years ago was that <laughs> we found out that another artist who's playing, Rebecca Lobie, yeah. had, had been a student of yours. So like a yeah. you know, student teacher playing at the same festival was just so cool. And we were both babies then. I mean, she was she started Berkeley at like 16 or 17, you know, whatever, hashtag overachiever. But, um, yeah. and, and I was teaching there and I was like 27 or something like that, 20, which, you know, I felt, I felt old then, but now I'm like, you know, <laughs> back, I was like, Oh Lord, I was still in diapers. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Man. And so how on earth did you choose piano over guitar? <laughs> I mean, there was a piano in our house. Yeah. Did your parents yeah. play at all or? Uh, well, my dad played guitar, uh, you know, the same four chords that he'd been playing since college, probably on the same guitar, probably with the same strings. Um, <laughs> and but my mom played piano and because her mother played piano um, and my mom played because it's what you do. You take piano lessons when you're a you know young woman in that generation. And uh, but my grandmother loved it, played by ear and and loved it and and it, played into adulthood and played in, you know, played for the radio station in college and all kinds of kinds of stuff. But, um, and I, they realized pretty early on that I could play by ear too, which I didn't know what I was doing. I just was doing what I was doing. Yeah. And my mom had showed me a little bit of uh, for release. Mm -hmm. No, the entertainer. Okay. And she showed me like just the beginning of it. And then I just was sitting there one day, like figuring out the rest. Cause I'd heard her do it. And my dad's like, who showed you that? I'm like, nobody. He's like, <laughs> I was like five. I don't know. Um, I was just That's in there. Good. And I was, I was probably, I think I was about 17 when I actually realized that my grandmother could do that too. And I was like, Whoa. wow. And yeah. so uh, it might've been a meandering road, but how did you wind up in Nashville? Other than, I mean, um, other than just the gravity of the place, drawing yeah. the musician, musician in. Well, I realized, you know, I was teaching at Berkeley, um, and you know, I wasn't happy living in Boston. You know, there were I there were aspects of teaching at Berkeley that I loved, but overall, I was like, this doesn't feel like where I'm supposed to be. This doesn't feel right, at least not for right now. And so, my husband at the time, we were talking about like, okay, if we, you know, I'm helping people find their way to their dreams when I haven't done mine yet. So we said, okay, we should go to a music town. Where, where are we going to go? We got New York, LA, or or Nashville. Because going back to Austin felt like going backwards. And he said, okay, I think the things you hate about Boston, you would hate about New York even more. And both of us, when we thought thought about LA, went, mm. um, <laughs> and then I went, wait a minute. It, it really, I swear, friend, it was like I remembered, like it went like coconut on the head, like, oh, I forgot. I've wanted to go to Nashville since I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, and then I started thinking about the people I knew there and the, 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 the type of music that gets done there, the type of work that gets done there. And I thought suddenly I could just see it. I was like, oh, I can, I can do that. I, that. That's a good fit. And you were able to go to Nashville already having a handful of friends and connections mm -hmm. there, which, yeah. may, which makes a huge difference. Yes. Yes. And, and that's the advice that I still give, um, Next spring will be 20 years since I got here, um, uh -huh. which is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, the advice that I still give people when they're new, you know, new to town and want to, you know, what do I do? How do I get into this, that or that? You know, I said, just keep meeting people because all of the gigs, all of the session work and, and background singer work and stuff that I've gotten has all been through other singers. And so like cool writing stuff is going to come through other writers and, cool, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not the the gatekeepers that you meet. It's the it's the other people that may already know a gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper doesn't have time to to try out new people. But if the gatekeeper trusts this person, they go you if you know you do the vetting. I trust who you bring in. Right. Aside from your your considerable work as a, as a solo act, you've you've become one of the first call background vocalists in Nashville. Did you get started in that kind of work early or is that something that evolved? Some of both. Um, I mean, I've always, when I, when I came to Nashville, I didn't have designs on doing the artist thing. I thought I want to, I'm going to do studio work and sing backups for people. Um, I wasn't thinking about writing. I'd started a record while I was in Boston, but I was like, I don't know. Ah, you know. Um, 
but I started meeting people and just anything I could do. Like I'm, I'm a super versatile singer. Like I got, I got a, a gig playing at this cute little Lutheran church. That's just up the street from me now. Um, and uh, so I played every Sunday morning and I was like, here, here, here are my pile of skills. Uh, can anybody use any of them in any sort of way? Um, so I, I did the church gig. I also had a gig singing Christmas carols at the Opry Mills Mall in Victorian dress. Nice. And big, big blue, big purple dress and bonnet and, you know. And at some point, uh, my friend Scarlett Keys, who is teaching up at Berkeley now, she and I just kind of like crisscrossed. Uh -huh. um, we'd been in vocal jazz together uh, when we were students. And she was in Nashville. And I think she was leaving Nashville, but somebody had asked it was like one of those restaurant piano bar gigs and someone said someone needed a fill-in and so i got to do that and that was kind of my first foray into that world so i'd do whatever i could and all the people that i would meet i would i kept trying to to dig into the whole session world and backups and stuff and and i i just took any gig i could at first and um at some point someone that i taught with gave me this guy's number and this guy gave me this guy's number and that was Bruce and Bruce produced a couple records for me. We ended up, you know, working together a lot, becoming good friends. But Bruce introduced me to one of his closest friends, Lisa, Lisa Silver, who's a singer and fiddle player and writer and all this stuff. And so we started doing sessions together. And Lisa got me on this session with a guy named Bergen White one time. And it was just a random session for some guy from Oklahoma. And I, Bergen happened to be impressed with me that day. And funnily enough, Bergen had a date that night at a restaurant where I was playing, <laughs> nice. he heard somebody, he was in there eating and he was like, is that a live person in there? Like, yeah. And like, Cause he heard somebody playing like jazz standards, but playing all the right chords, and, you know, his <laughs> ear was like, what's that? So he came in and he was like, damn. Um, and it was about, it was only a week or two later uh, when I got a call from him. Um, he had vetted me through Lisa first uh, to do a show with Martina McBride. Uh, for PBS Soundstage. And that was my first first big gig with an artist, with a big artist, and my first TV gig. So I was like, <laughs> you know. Because um, he, you know, Bergen called Lisa, can she can she read? Oh yeah, she can read. You know, can she, is she cool? But, you know, can she do this? Can she, can she, you know, and Lisa's like, Bergen, she can do whatever you need. Yeah. And so he got me on that gig and he's been calling me ever since. And Bergen White has been, uh, he was the musical director for the CMA Awards for a lot of, lot of years. He's a legendary arranger and uh, contractor here in town, vocal arranger and string arranger. I mean, there's so, so, so many records that once Elvis heard Bergen's version of po Pope Salinani on that um, Tony Joe White record, he's like, get me that guy. And then he didn't use anybody else wow. for the rest of his life. Yeah. And so you've you've been touring with Martina for a long time. The the Christmas tour, how long has that been going on? Um, the first Christmas tour I did, and I just do Christmas stuff with her. I don't do stuff with her for the rest of the year. It's this whole special right. special thing. But um, the first one I did was 2012. And I think she had done something before, but it, you know, she was kind of, let's try this Christmas tour thing again and let's try it this way. And again, it was Bergen. He's like, hey, right. Martina just called. She wants to put a Christmas tour together. I was like, I'm in. You know? Yeah. Um, so that was my first bus tour. Um, and so we did 2012, 2013, and then we didn't do it again until 2017. Oh, okay. So there was like 2017, 2018, 2019. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. If you are enjoying this podcast, can you pause for a moment to like review and subscribe? Please help the world discover our music community and the wonderful artists we support. Your feedback makes a difference. And so uh, another fun thing uh, that we see <laughs> all the time on, on your Instagram and Facebook is you palling around with Wonder Woman. Uh, yeah. It, uh, it, uh, not only have you worked with her, but it, it seems like you guys have become really good friends. Tell, yeah. me a little bit, tell me a little bit about how that happened and maybe a couple highlights from touring with her. Again, uh, somebody that I met through Bruce and Lisa the singer named Cindy Walker, not the Cindy Walker that wrote You Don't Know Me, but um, different Cindy Walker, but another amazing singer here in town, lives in Muscle Shoals, actually. So she's kind of back and forth, Muscle Shoals in Nashville. Cindy and I had done a bunch of session work together with Lisa, usually. And um, Cindy called me 
probably four, five, probably five years ago now and said, hey, you know, I'm just kind of testing the waters here. You know, I've been doing these gigs with Linda Carter and we may need to make a change and there may be an opening in the in the background vocal section. If so, do you want to get the call? And I was like, yeah, I, call. I don't know what I'm going to be doing, but call me, you know, absolutely. So then it was about a year later, I was at Folk Alliance and I had just walked in to see you uh, at a booth. And uh, this was 2016. This was um, a, this was the Folk, Al Folk Alliance uh, Midwest, right? No, this was this was I think it was the big Folk Alliance. Oh, the big one. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Kansas City, probably. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I remember, you know, I get so stressed out at those things. I had I'd gotten Wonder Woman pajamas for Christmas, and and, and I had <laughs> worn them the night before as like fortification to get through the mayhem of Folk Alliance. So and, hang on. So the, is this a superstition thing, or just kind of a whimsical thing that? It was just yeah. a whimsical thing, you know. Yeah, and, that's hilarious. Um, I'm going to make this yeah. happen by wearing my Wonder Woman PJs. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was like, this is going to, this is going to give me, this is going to empower me, <sighs> you know. And I had just finished something, and I had checked my voicemail on my way to like walking to see you, and I'm listening to my phone, and I'm like, and it's my friend, it's Tanya. She's like, hey, this is Tanya. You know, we've we've done some sessions together. Da da da. da. I'm calling to see if you're available to do some dates with Linda Carter. And then, and then, and then rehearsals start here, and this is when the gigs are. And I was like, "Huh, where's Wonder Woman pajamas? Gets gig with Wonder Woman." So <laughs> I, I shit you not, I started googling like Bonnie Raitt pajamas, Wonder pajamas. Like, do these things exist? So I was like, "I'm gonna manifest the rest of my background singing life via pajamas." Nice. Or hey. to try. Can't hurt, might help. Can't hurt, might help. Either way, you look stylish. So, exactly. So I, you know, I said of course i'd love to do the gig and i show up for rehearsal and you know meet her for the first time and of course she's she's still wonder woman i mean yeah. i'm like oh it's it's you yeah <laughs> hi of course you're still beautiful and amazing and and i had my, had my parents find the picture of me in my wonder woman swimsuit and my blue rain boots and my <laughs> paper crown when i was six years old like everybody has yeah um and I still have I still have my gold bracelets. No, I'm just kidding. You do I know you do? I know you do. <laughs> Don't lie, I know you do. But she's been an absolute delight. Um, she she surrounds herself with uh, with an amazing band um, and treats us really really well. Well, takes great care of us and always is always acknowledging us um, from the stage on stage and off. And it's yeah. it's been a real joy to get to know her and to get to work with her and. And and yeah, and to be able to call her my friend, be able to text her and be like, "What's up?" Da -da -da, you know. And you you, get, <laughs> you occasionally get to fly in the invisible jet. Yes. <laughs> have occasionally gotten to fly, you know, privately with her. They, they must like, have. That they must will ruin you. Oh my god. They must have a joke about her private jet. Like, is it? Oh, uh, is it painted? Well, you, no, it's not her. It's, no, she it's doesn't not, have her own plane. Okay. You know, okay. Because she you know, could. Her, it's her husband's company. Her, her husband's company, I think, has a, has an account where they can like. Uh, you know, I would just I would just think they'd paint, lose the plane or something. They would paint it, you know, sky colored, so it would look invisible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you'd That's think. Funny. You'd think, but yeah, so, it's a delight. So let's talk about your solo stuff. You've done uh, a handful of, of really great records, but your last one, 3 a.m., was just mm. super stellar. And I remember getting a chance to hear that at your place on this oh, yeah. uh, amazing turntable that is right there behind that you. One? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with the tube sticking uh -huh. out all over the place. Tube amp, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, tell me a little bit about the. Uh, it was kind of a recovery album, so to speak. For oh yeah, it. it was my epic breakup album. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, my second husband and I used to work together a lot. In fact, when I first joined uh, Listening Room Network, uh, it was when he and I were touring together. So we yeah. did a lot of stuff together as a duo um, through the network and everything. And um, and when that fell apart, I just wrote my way out of it. And you know, like everybody does. Um, but um, and then that was a record. And so is 3 a.m. a time for reflection or a time for bad decisions? <laughs> uh, it was uh, probably a little bit of both, but mostly reflection. <laughs> mostly reflection. It was just like, you know, you go through something like that and, you know, I couldn't sleep. Um, yeah. 
and I could fall asleep fine, but I'd wake up at three in the morning, just, yeah. so, so I'd be, you know, the bad decisions where I'd be up at three in the morning, smoking cigarettes and writing in my journal. Um, yeah. and a lot of that stuff turned into songs. Yeah. Um, and so that's, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of truth telling at three in the morning. You know? Yeah. There's also a lot of crazy thoughts going on at three in the morning, mm. but just something about it, like that whole, I can't sleep. I don't want to be missing you right now, but I am. And that sucks. So what do I do with that? Um, or, you know, or you wake up at three in the morning and suddenly, you know, hang on a minute, you know, whichever, whichever emotion it was. But by the time the record came out, you had <laughs> yeah. hooked up with a sweetheart of a man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, was it, I was apparently that... experienced life uh, faster than I, than I write about it. Um, <laughs> that was not planned, but. You know. <laughs> I'm happy as ever, but here's my very, very sad <laughs> record. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. It was crazy. Like, you know, because Glenn and I got married in uh, May of 2016, and then I put the record out in June. <laughs> and everybody's like, wait, what? <laughs> And I was like, no, 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 no. It's all good. That, it's, I know it's weird, but yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. And then, uh, and so you guys have, have done a bunch of stuff together. You, uh, you had some amazing travels that we got to see and, and be jealous yeah. of on, uh, on social media. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but I have to ask, with, with this big pandemic, as you were in the middle <sighs> of taking this big leap and opening up a piano bar. Yeah. Yeah. We picked a heck of a time to open a bar. My goodness. Yeah. yeah. So are, do you guys have some runway or are. Well, I mean, honestly. Cause I know it's, it's not just you guys, not, right? You're part of yeah, a, a, yeah, yeah, a group yeah, of yeah. folks. Yeah. And, and we're not ready to be open yet. So it, we were supposed to open in the spring, like end, end of February, beginning of March, which would have been a nightmare if we were actually, if we'd have been ready that would have been a nightmare. Like, okay, here we go. Never mind. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Um, but between the tornado, which hit March 3rd here in Nashville, um, slowing everything down and, you know, construction and codes and things like everybody was busy dealing with that and fine, go do that. Obviously take care of the people that need it. Um, and then just it taken a while. Um, you know, we're still not quite ready. We're almost there. Um, yeah. We've got just little little things to do to get our, our licensing um, uh, health inspection and things like that. And then we should be ready to go. Um, but yeah, it's it's called Sid Gold's Request Room. Request Room, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And um, this is another thing that came through just talking to people I know. Um, Keith Thompson, Cowboy Keith, um, is Linda Carter's tour manager. And several years back when we were in New York with Linda, um, Cowboy said, hey, my friend's got this live piano karaoke bar. Let's go. I was like, okay. So we went and checked out the live piano karaoke bar called Sid Gold's in New York. And that was super fun, whatever. Fast forward a few years, Glenn and I start talking about, you know, he left his his 25-year career working in oil and gas on seismic survey ships, took the severance package, and was looking at what to do next. And we'd always sort of entertained ourselves. If wouldn't it be neat to have a place kind of like Don's Depot, but our version of it and didn't really take it seriously. But he's like, I keep thinking about that piano bar. So we started talking to folks about what the heck does that entail? Cause we never even worked in a bar. We didn't know what we were doing and realized very quickly that we really didn't know what we were doing. And I just started, kept talking but, to people that- But you know drinks. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, and, um, and started talking to people that, that had worked in the industry and, and was talking to Cowboy about it one time on the road. And he goes, you know, Paul is opening a Sid Gold's in Nashville and he's looking for investors. And I was like, well, that's not quite what we were going to do, but it's close enough. And the timing is like, yes, I will absolutely meet with Paul. Let's talk about it. And yeah. I realized quickly in that meeting, he's like, well, you know, I said, we're not just looking for an investment. My husband needs something to do. And he's like, I can teach him how to manage the bar. He can be the day-to-day -day manager. I was like, fantastic. And we realized we could get into a place with a smaller investment than if we threw everything we had at our own place. And we'd be working with people. Paul's been doing this for 25 years. Um, and we could, re we could determine whether or not we liked working in a bar and determine whether or not we liked working together because that's different than just being married and living together. Um, and then we decided, even if we decided we hated it, we still thought it'd be a good investment. Um, 
And so here we are. Well, so, so it, far, so I, good. <laughs> do I recall, was there some co connection to Fountains of Wayne in the ownership of that uh, bar? Adam, yeah. Whose last name is escaping me right now, which yeah. is embarrassing, but it's okay. um, yeah, he was one of the, um, I think, investors in the in the original one in New York, and he's good buddies with all those guys. And I gotcha. he passed away. He was one of the early COVID victims, I think, like end of March, early April. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, what's going on in your neighborhood now? Like Slushinger, a, Slushinger. Yeah, Adam Slushinger. Yeah, I can't say it right. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah. Um, so, what's going on with you right now musically? Are you are you writing a bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I've been I've been playing a lot. Um, I started I started live streaming during the pandemic and just loved it some people really don't like it um but i really do like it um so i've been playing every thursday night and just like i used to do at dawn's and then on sunday afternoons i'll play standards like jazz standards and stuff so and you, i take requests and that's fun you know so you're kind of doing like a scheduled twice a week two mm -hmm. different shows one, one show each day yep okay yep. yeah and I, I took a break for a couple of weeks just because i was like is this dumb is do i uh, you know uh, Are people tired of this? Like, because everybody, everybody had stream fatigue, and, right. and you know the tips were going down, the viewership was going down, but that was the case for everybody. And right, and I realized that that I I missed it enough that I was like, okay, this I am a more sane person when I do this, and I I, I missed you people, even if there was only five or six of you, I miss you. You know, yeah, so, that's great. So I started doing it again. Yeah, it's, yeah, and it's been great. And different people pop in each time. You never know. Just and then you, you and Glenn also do a little cocktail hour on. Facebook once in a while. It's kind we of were fun. doing that for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just from the from this, we just did that one night because we got into making cocktails at home a couple of years ago. I think when I was uh, laid up after a foot surgery, we couldn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, and we've just gotten really into it and the fun of, of the different ingredients and the fun glassware and stuff. And, yeah. and um, one time we were just home making cocktails. I was like, let's just turn on Facebook Live and hang out with people and and you know, without any planning, we just popped up and we did that a couple of times. And then we're like, you know, we should actually like plan this and invite people along and, and tell them what we're going to make. And then, and it just kind of went from there. And then somebody was like, you know, you should do that from the Sid Gold's page. And I was like, oh, that's actually a good idea. You guys yeah. are open in a bar, right? Do it from the bar page. I was like, oh yeah. 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 So good. we started wearing our Sid Gold's t-shirts and, you know. Nice. Um, and we had the preview party for the bar um, a couple of weeks back. And so we haven't done anything since then because we've just been, you know, yeah. chaotically trying to get ready to really open. But And I forget where it is in relation to where you're sitting right now, but is there any way you could swing the 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 camera around to see the piano bar that you have? Yeah. yeah. Cause it's, it's the coolest, what the coolest bar setup I've ever seen. So, yeah. And it's not, it, the it's, lights on, you know, is there like, there's a, that way. there's a, glass cover on top of the keys right yeah come on baby oh man <laughs> rude that's not your wisconsin edit accent. this part out there we go there i know <laughs> oh geez how come it's not working <laughs> even in nashville too long or not probably not too long <laughs> oh it uh, comes out as soon as i start yeah. talking to somebody from home yeah yeah what an awesome bar yeah 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 what I a treat it. So that was Glenn's mom's piano. But well, it, well, okay, I was wasn't sure if it was an actual piano or if it, it was a, oh, a yeah. bar made to look yeah. like a piano. No, it was his mom's piano, and it just it didn't it wouldn't hold tune anymore. And we were trying to figure out what to do with it, and um, and there weren't any. It's like, well, we could donate to somebody who like doesn't really care whether it's in tune or not. But it's Nashville; everybody cares. Plus, there's there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pianos around that will stay in tune. So, then I just started googling upcycled pianos and. There you go. That came out. Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, so nice to catch up with you, Kira. Yeah. Um, for the listeners out there, uh, Kira is a wonderful singer-songwriter. Check out her most recent CD called 3 AM. You can find it everywhere online. And she's also a fabulous touring artist. If you, uh, if you host house concerts or if you have a lovely venue, once the pandemic clears, uh, you should definitely look at having Kira visit your place you will be, at your girl. you will be entertained thanks kira yeah. great to see you oh you bet you too bye bye Bye. thanks for listening to the fran snyder podcast please subscribe like or share to help your friends discover this community 
Also, I'd love to hear from you with any feedback or suggestions you have. And if you'd like to learn more about house concerts and listening rooms around the world, please visit and join listeningroomnetwork.com. You can email me from there. See you next time on the Fran Snyder Podcast.